Hey guys, it's Andrew from Collective Intelligence, and today we're going to be taking a look at DJing inside of Ableton Live. This is the third video in a three video series. If you haven't seen the other two videos, they're in the description below. You can find the links, watch them first, then watch this one. This video builds on the ideas of the last, but let's get started. Let's jump into Ableton. Here we are. We've got Ableton in front of us, and we're back to where we left off in the last episode. So I'm going to show you guys a couple of ideas. So we're going to look at how to use dummy clips to automate uh, change over time without the need of actually inputting commands to the MIDI controller. And then I'm going to show you follow actions. Uh, and then we will take a look at queuing so that you can queue your mix. And then we'll take a look at how you can set up a crossfader. So uh, I will put in the description and hopefully in the timeline down the bottom of Ableton where I do all of these things along the way starting with taking a look at using the dummy clips. To set up dummy clip we'll come over to Ableton and we'll just hit record on the Q channel here and we're going to record a bit of time. So we'll just record let's say four bars. Uh, once that's done we're going to grab it, uh, we'll consolidate it to that length, we'll grab it uh, we'll press tab and then we can drop it on the Q channel here. All right, and what we're able to do is we're able to use this empty audio clip to automate something over a period of time. So we can grab the auto filter and chuck it on the channel and then come back into in, inside of the clip. And in the envelope section here, we can select the auto filter and we can control a number of things such as the device coming on. So um, in its neutral state, we'll just say that the device should be off like so. So before the clip it's off and then it turns on um, and then we'll do something like that as well, right? Uh, and then we can go to the frequency um, of the device and we can pull that all the way down. So when it starts, it's at the bottom. Um, it comes up to say, let's say like 6,000 kilohertz and then it comes back down again. And we can put a little bit of a ramp in there by pressing alt and bending that. Um, and we could put a little resonance on it, but in this case, I, I won't do that. Um, so what will happen is when we're, um, and I need to put that on, um, sorry, a high pass filter as well so that um, the frequencies are around the right way. So yeah, frequency starts from bottom. Yeah, cool. So um, if we've got the timeline playing, uh, we're not playing the track and we just press play on this. We wait till the end of four bars and then it'll start going. We'll watch the filter and see what happens, right? So the filter is now following that automation curve and it's opening and then sweeping back closed and then turning off, right? So its natural state should be off. So um, at the moment, it's not going to do anything because the audio is going straight to channel one, but we can set it up so that we say um, the audio goes to, instead of channel one, it goes to Q. So channel one to Q um, and then on here, we can say we don't want any input and we can monitor the input coming from here, right? So no input, monitor, monitor input. And then what's going to be happening is that this, um, the tracks channel feeds into the Q channel and then the Q channel feeds into the channel one and then the channel one feeds to the master, right? Um, so we've got a clear signal chain. And now what's going to happen is I'm going to play the track We'll skip it to a part where something's happening and then we can trigger this dummy clip. So I've pressed it, we wait till the end of four bars and then it's gonna turn itself on. It's turned on now. It's filtering out. Right, so it just followed that automation curve all by itself. Um, and if I trigger it again, it's gonna happen again. All right, here we go. Great. So this is how we can make things happen without having to control the controller. So you can take whatever effect you think and apply it there. Um, I tried it with like a time slow effect, um, some gating effects, beat repeat effects. You can do all sorts of really cool stuff. So start experimenting with that. Anything that you can automate, you can automate inside of the envelope clip here. Um, the tricky thing is just, yeah, making sure that you, if the device 
um, changes the sound when it's turned on, it's probably good to automate the device on and off. So for example, this auto filter, even when it's switched on, that changes the way that the bass sounds, right? So that's a destructive, um, as the signal passes through that auto filter, the auto filter is essentially degrading the signal. We could think of it as that. So when that's switched off, there's no signal, signal degradation. Um, there's a really interesting piece in the Ableton manual that talks to you about all of the things in Ableton that actually affect the sound of the original source signal. So if you've got a uncompressed uh, audio file and it's running through Ableton, um, yeah, it just shows you what will not alter the way it sounds and what will. So for example, running through this rack, because that EQ3 is on, it, it's going to get altered by that EQ3. But because these auto filters are automated off, it's not being altered. So if we weren't using the EQ3 and we were just using the filters and we were only using the filters when they were um, off of the zero point they were turned on, then this only when the, the filter is engaged, when it will, will it modify the signal. So when the fig signal is passing directly through, the audience will be getting the pure wave file um, through the sound card conversion and then through the mixer without any modification, right? So... Yeah, if you're trying to achieve the cleanest audio signal, um, probably don't do this. It's going to color the sound for sure. Um, just use the track fader. Although they say as well, even using track faders colors the sound because it's changing the audio as it comes through. So you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't on that one. Anyway, next we're going to look at follow action. Just a pro tip for you guys as well. Um, if you're looking at the filter, you can right click on the timeline and clear the envelopes so you don't have any automation on there. Okay, so I've set up a, a second clip, and the second clip's going to control a phase, a, a flanger. I mean, this is not the sort of effect that you would want to use in the way that I'm about to use it, but um, you can see the principle of what I'm trying to get across to you. So simply just automating the um, on and off of the device so it plays during that uh, four bar period of time. And by the way, obviously, if you want it to work for shorter periods of time, you just change the length of the audio clip that you've got. Um so we'll we'll show you we'll, we'll have a, have a look at follow actions. So follow actions, you can find them in the uh, the launch section here. You will only see this when you're in the session view. So if you're in the um, arrangement view, this isn't going to show up. Right. So what a follow action is is when when I play a clip, uh, and that clip gets to its end, uh, we can issue a command to this track to um, launch another clip, basically. So if I select both of these clips. Um, well, or, or I can just select the first one, right? So the first one, I'm going to say once this filter automation has finished its um, journey and it goes back to the, uh, when it gets to the end of the bar, what's it going to do? It's going to set a follow action and that follow action, I'll set it to uh, four bars. So the, once I trigger the clip, the follow action will start in four bars time. Right. So if I had that set to one bar, if I start the clip before it even gets to the end of all of that filter automation we drew in, it's only it's going to do the first part of the filter automation and then it's going to jump to the next clip. So we don't want that. We want it to let the first clip play out all of its automation. And then we want it to jump to the next clip in the track. Let's see that in principle. Let's play the track. Let's trigger for the envelope and we'll watch the effects here we, we can see the play button here so now the effect is triggered the auto filters sweeping up and you can see it's getting ready to start playing the next clip which is now the flanger and now the flanger is playing and unfortunately we've run into a problem here where the filter um is stuck open and that's maybe got something to do with yeah where we've got that set on the um on the next clip and that's um unfortunate so we just need to set that back to let's say all the way down um and we, we shouldn't actually have to do this um i i suspect that the reason why i'm doing this is because um the filter was in this position when i was setting up the um the clip but anyway let's just do this um and we'll re-trigger that. Right, so let's reset that. Um, now, th yeah, this can be a little bit tricky to get it right, but let's try it again. So now that's turned off, right? So the state for that flanger is off when we trigger this one. 
Right, and it's switching itself back on. Um, so that's either a problem with the first clip. Um, so either this clip here. Um, it looks to be correct with the device on and off. Um, and now the auto filter. The auto filter really should just be off the whole time, actually, when that other one's triggered. So let's see how we go with this. A little bit of playing around. Sorry, guys, it would be better if it's a little bit more concise, but right now that's switched off and now the flange is on. And now there's no next action to issue to this. So it just cuts, right? So if we had this on loop, it would play around and around. If we had a follow action on it to play um, another clip, it would potentially go back and play the first clip again, and then they would perpetually keep playing off of each other. But you can use follow actions in very interesting ways. You can play around with the parameters. This is a probability chance that it's either going to follow the next ish command or the other command. And you can say it's a um, particular ratio that that's either going to happen or that's going to happen. So you can play around with that. Um, you can also trigger the clips in different ways. Now, this could be interesting if you had something different that you're going to play over top and you, when you want the, when you press the button, you want to press and hold and it does the effect. And then when you take your finger off the button, it stops, right? So you can use gate for that. So the gate works as in push triggers it, push off, turns it off. So if you just push it, it's going to trigger it on quickly and then off quickly. So you have to hold it. Um, there's a couple of other ones there for you. So trigger is button press on, starts it on, button press again on, turns it off, right? So that's the follow actions. Next, we'll take a look at the queue. Just another little point to make as well, guys. Um, you can't play two clips at the same time. So if you would want both of these effects to play at the same time, you might have to get into some pretty crazy routing. So you might want to make another audio channel. You might want to feed this one into the next audio channel and then send this one to the master, right? So now you're chaining it through um, that channel and that channel, and then you can actually trigger both these clips at the same time, right? Whereas when they're on the same channel, you can only have one triggered at a time. So just a little pro tip there. Um, you may get out of control with having a lot of things if you want to control a lot of effects at a time. That's why, of course, we've always we've still got our master effects chained and we've still got our filter effects chained. So you can do some cool things with this, but maybe you can't make a shitload of channels for it, so that's fine. Um, so yeah, Q. How do we set up the Q? So <clears throat> I'll attract your attention over here. Um, so you've got master out and you've got Q out. And you may never have seen that there's actually a Q out. Uh, so in order to do this really effectively, um, it's great to have a sound card where your headphone output is actually on a second set of inputs or outputs, sorry. Um, so sound card one and two is outputting to my studio monitors or you can think of it as though it's outputting to the mixer, which is then going to output to the crowd. Um, so there's, you know, one way of doing it. Um, sorry, not one way of doing it, but that's how that signal chain works. If you've got three and four, then you may have a second set of outputs that could potentially be your headphones um, or even a second set of monitors, which you could have, let's say, one pair of monitors on channel one and two that face the crowd. And then one pair of monitors that face you that are three and four, that are EQ. Now, I can't set it up uh, correctly because my three and four output is actually not for my headphones. So um, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the master is going to be on that headphone and uh, the right channel. Um, and then the Q is going to be on the left channel. And now I'm going to show you um, how the queue works. So once you've got the queue on, you can toggle the queue from being active down here. So solo is what you're used to seeing. It's this little blue button that turns solo on or off. But if you click it, now you've got queue, right? So now you can hear the, well, when you set it up properly, you can hear the track before it goes out to the um, audience. So if I grab the volume of the channel and I pull it all the way down, I play the track the audience doesn't hear it and we don't hear it. But if I activate the cue, 
we hear it on the left-hand channel. So the Q um, needs to be enabled here. And then once we're satisfied that the track is going to mix with the other track or, you know, whatever we're checking without the audience hearing it, then we can go, all right, now it's time for them to have it. All right, and you bring it up and now both the audience is hearing it and you can still hear it on your queue. And then to deactivate it and maybe start listening to the other channel for the track that you've got playing on the other channel, you can set it up like that, right? So that's one, um, that's the way that you do the queue. But you're going to run into a problem if you've set things up the way I have. Because if you go and you pull these faders down and then we try and do that same thing, exactly the same again, all right, I press the Q, we don't hear anything anymore. And the reason that is, is because this is obviously choking the signal chain. So the audio is going from this channel to this channel to this channel to that channel. It comes in here and then it hits the EQ and the EQ mutes it. No volume coming through, nothing coming out of the end of the signal chain, nothing coming into the channel. So the reason why uh, you, you might say to me now, like, okay, Andrew, you've got that all the way down, but we could still hear the cue even when you had the track fader down. The reason for that is, I've just turned these back up, right? The reason for that is the signal goes to the cue before the mixer section on the channel. It's pre-mixer. So it goes to the master after the mixer. So if we pull that down, it's not going to the master, but it still goes to the queue because the queue doesn't run through this. It goes from the end of, and it goes straight to the output. A way around it is if you're choking the channel here, you can actually just, you, you can cue the track down here, right? So we still hear it, even though now that's all the way pulled down. Right, because we're sending that to the to the queue. Um, sweet. Hopefully that's straightforward. Hopefully I haven't confused you guys. Um, so that's a way around it. it. It might be inconvenient for you to queue that channel. Uh, the reason I would do it on that channel is because if you got effects on both of these, you'll hear it on this channel. Um, if you queue it there, you won't hear any effects that you've got after it. Great. So now, finally, we're going to look at the crossfader. So the crossfader is located down here and uh, you've got A or B. So let's go ahead and set this back to being one, two, and three, four, right? So I just want to hear it normally. I'm not going to cue anything. We'll put that channel on B and that channel on A and then we'll play this track here and we'll play the other track from the beginning. And um, right now... We don't hear anything. Why am I not hearing anything? Because i got the faders turned down. Um, and we're only hearing the A channel right now. And if I move the crossfader over, we hear the other channel. And if I skip the track along, you can actually tell they're diff at different stages, right? So this can be assigned to a crossfader like this. You could assign it to a knob. Um, and it's basically just going between whatever you've selected A and whatever you select as B. And I, on the APC, you can toggle it, right? So I can turn it off altogether by not having anything selected, or I can have it on A or have it on B. So happy days, you can quickly set that up and fade between things. Now, if you right click on this, you can change it from a constant power crossfade to a dipped crossfade to whatever else. And if you wanna know more about these crossfade um, how the filters transition and the volume gain um, occurs across that change. Jump into the Ableton manual and you'll see all about that. You can type basically on, in Google, you can type um, crossfade Ableton manual and it'll bring you to that and you'll be able to see it. Cool. All right. So that's everything for this video. Hopefully they were some really interesting tips for you guys. Um, go and mix some really cool sets, go and perform some really cool sets. I'll see you in another video. Take care of yourselves.